let's quickly talk about our friend the honeybee. Now, honeybees have been cared for by humans since ancient times. Uh, the ancient Egyptians are thought to have the first real beekeeping, I guess, structure and, and methods for use. And actually, I've heard stories that the ancient Egyptians used to put beehives on their ships. And when they were out at sea, they would watch which direction the bees would fly in, and that would take them to land. So they actually used bees as the first GPS, GBS, I guess you could say. The modern beehive style was invented in the 1800s by Lorenzo Langstroth. He was a Philadelphia native. That's the honeybee hive type that we all know and love with the boxes and the frames on the inside. However, bees are not native to the United States, honeybees. They were brought over around the 1600s by European explorers. Um, they are uh, a managed livestock, basically. They're an incredibly important livestock, but they are in a livestock. They are not a, a native species. And actually, studies are starting to show that they do serve to outcompete a lot of our native bee species, both in floral resources and sometimes in habitat as well. Also, honeybees are vectors for some pests and diseases that are known to cross the boundary between honeybees and our native bee species. And so if you do keep honeybees, it's paramount that you keep as healthy honeybees as possible. Because as we all know, they travel to and forth about two miles to and from their, their hive to get flowers. They have a huge radius in which they can spread these pests and diseases. And so just keeping healthy honeybees is the most important thing you can do to be environmentally conscious if you're keeping honeybees. Now, while they're important managed livestock, they're actually pretty terrible at pollinating, especially compared to native bee species. The statistics I seem to remember is honeybees pollinate around 15% of the flowers they land on, whereas some of our native species pollinate around 90 to 99% of the flowers they land on. And now, honeybees perform most of their pollination services through sheer numbers alone. One of the main reasons that they're so bad at pollination is this right here. Now, as we learn, this is a corbiculi. It's a specialized basket of hairs that really works well to cram and collect pollen into it. Honeybees have these because they have a whole lot of larvae back home that they need to get as much pollen back to as possible. So they need to have the most efficient method of collecting this pollen as possible. So that's what they do. They collect and move all of this pollen into their basket. But since it's so good and effective at holding that pollen in, it's very bad at actually pollinating. So when a honeybee will go from flower to flower, very little amounts of that pollen will actually become dislodged and come in contact with the flower. Now that's a major difference between most of our native bees and honeybees. Most of our native bees don't have those cubiculi. Instead, they gather pollen all over their body. They don't bother in kind of collecting it all in one spot. And as a consequence, they're much messier, which is much better for plants. And so again, our native bees are the pollination machines, whereas honeybees are really, they're not that great at it. So while we're talking about the benefits of native bees compared to honeybees and pollination, it's important to note that native bees are generally active in cooler temperatures than honeybees as well. This is because of their small size, like this little small carpenter bee or serotina bee. Uh, some native bees are around the size of a grain of rice, and they're dark, which gives them a very easy and quick time to warm up in the sun and get out and flying when bee, uh, honeybees and other insects might be too cold to really get out and fly. For example, honeybee mussels stop working at about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. They actually can't move when they're colder than that, uh, just to give you an idea. Um, bumblebees and other large bees, like carpenter bees, can also vibrate their flight muscles in order to generate heat, giving them that extra boost of energy that they need when it's really cold. Native bees also generally visit flowers in a random fashion, going to whichever flowers they come across as they travel through an area, which is very different to honeybees, who display what's known as floral constancy, whereas they pick one or two blooms and they tend to only visit those blooms until they're, they're not accessible anymore. And so in a mixed, in an area with a lot of mixed plants, also called a garden, it's very beneficial to have more native bees than actually honeybees because you'll get more uh, diverse pollination as long as more effective pollination uh, with those native bees. So now, recent studies have also shown that the hairs on a bee's body become attracted to the electrical fields around flowers. So kind of similar to how your hair stands up on end when you rub a balloon on it, uh, bee hairs do the same type of thing to flowers as they fly up close to flowers. And so their hairs actually point in the direction of the closest flowers 
gives them an easier time of navigating in really dense environments. Now, a handful of orchard mason bee females, like this orchard mason bee female, are enough to pollinate an entire apple tree. They also outperform honeybees in bad weather and can double a cherry crop compared to honeybees. This is, again, because of their just haphazard, messy type of pollination. You can see just the hairs all over this bee. Again, it's one of the main reasons is because they don't have those corbiculi or the really specialized pollen baskets. Now, here's just some cool bees. Now, this is a, a green sweat bee, I believe. Just really shiny, cool looking. You will see probably some very similar looking bees in and around your garden. And then this is just a great example of a leaf cutter bee. Now, one really easy way to tell a leaf cutter, most leaf cutter bees apart from other bees, is where they carry their pollen. Now, if you couldn't guess, they've basically got a butt mohawk and they carry all of their or most of their, the pollen that they collect right on the bottom of their abdomen. And so if you, if you see a bee kind of flying around with, a, with an abdomen bottom full of pollen, most likely it's a leafcutter bee. Now that was a shot of one terribly artifacted, but uh, basically when they're on a flower as well, they tend to carry their abdomen almost straight up in the air to try and keep that pollen from falling off. But it's very distinct in a lot of those species. If you see a bee walking with his butt up in the air, it might be a leafcutter bee. So now let's quickly talk about bumblebees since these are some of the most easily recognizable and common bees that you'll see in and around your garden. A good percentage of bumblebee species are social. So like honeybees, there exists a colony structure centered around a queen. Bumblebee colonies do not survive the winter, however. And now that's the reason why European honeybees make such huge amounts of stored honey. It's because they're one of the very few, if not the only bee species, that the whole colony survives the winter time. So they need huge stores of honey to survive all of that dearth period where there's nothing in bloom. Bumblebees, on the other hand, are some of our only native species that make true beeswax, and they also do make true honey. They inject the same enzyme that honeybees do into nectar to separate the complex sugars into simple sugars and turn it into a true honey. But they don't make the huge stores that honeybees do because the whole colony does not survive the winter time. New queens hatch at the end of the summer and they spend the winter in leaf piles or other protected areas. And actually they pump an antifreeze solution through their bodies in the winter time to keep from freezing, similar to like uh, different frogs and toads do as well. So in early spring, there's a strong chance that all the bumblebees you see are queens. Uh, those queens in the spring, they found an, a new nest, they do all the work until their progeny start to hatch, and then their young start to take up some of the load and do a lot of the work after that. But in the spring, keep an eye out. Queens are a little bit bigger and fuzzier than the normal ones. So give a high five to your local queen when you see her. Now, like we went over earlier, uh, they do usually nest in abandoned mouse or bird's nests at the base of a grass tuft or maybe in a birdhouse. These are very docile species, even though they're social. Um, and each colony consists of about 30 to 100 workers. Some are known to get to as much as about 400 workers, but compare that to the 50,000 workers that a honeybee hive might reach, and they're kind of dwarfed in hive size when it comes uh, to honeybees. Now, bumblebees also possess some of the most advanced cuckoo species, some of which actually take over a colony and they physically bully that colony into working for itself. And so most of our bumblebee species also do have very intricately connected cuckoo species as well that can kind of almost take over a hive even after it's been established. As also we went over earlier, bumblebees are used commercially and they're really used in greenhouses to great effect to pollinate uh, tomatoes, and other crops that benefit from sonication or buzz pollination. We've learned how that works, but bumblebees are some of our greatest uh, and most uh, frequent users of buzz pollination that we can see in and around our gardens. The others are carpenter bees, which we'll talk about in just a second. Now, bumblebees also have longer tongues than most other bees, which allows them to access a huge variety of flowers. Uh, like most native species, they're also active in cooler temperatures and lower light levels than honeybees. Basically, honeybees can afford to take a bad day off because they've got all those stores, whereas some of our native species can't afford to take any days off, and so they're forced to work in much more inclement weather than honeybees are. Another reason uh, to, to favor them over honeybees. So 
Uh, the identification of bumblebees by coloration alone can be quite difficult, and this is due to an interesting survival mechanism that most bumblebees have. What they do is actually, all the bumblebee species, even though they're different in the same area, they tend to adopt similar warning colorations as the other bumblebee species in their area. And now this is thought to have evolved so that the predators in the area will be more likely to recognize that warning coloration versus a bunch of different uh, warning colorations spread out between the bumblebees. So keep in mind that uh, while you may see two bumblebees that look very similar, chances are they might be different species that are both mimicking each other. A very interesting survival strategy. Now, the best way to foster populations of bumblebees, as we've kind of learned, is to leave property or areas of your property untouched. Uh, generally, when you're fostering all native insects, going wild is the best thing you can do. So leave standing dead trees when you can, leave tufts of grass when you can, leave leaf piles and mulch piles, any refuse piles that you have maybe on the fringes of your property, leave them be and that might become a good home for bumblebees. Now, this is an action shot of a bumblebee that shows the benefits that a long tongue might come in collecting nectar. Bumblebees have access to um, really the, one of the biggest variety of flowers that almost all bees do. And so if you're planting a garden specifically for bumblebees, you really don't need to worry about too much the type of flower because bumblebees can access almost all flower types. And the ones that they can access, like again we saw um, on a slide, uh, they will rob those flowers and actually make their own little nectary where they can then feed from. Uh, and notice also here the corbiculi just stuffed full. Like we talked about, bumblebees are some of our only really social native species of bee, and so they do need those corbiculi to really efficiently get that pollen back to the hive. But they are still much more efficient at pollinating than honeybees. I mean, just look how much hairier they are. So bumblebees are often confused with carpenter bees. Now, the best way I've found to distinguish the, the two of them is look to the butt. Now, Carpenter bees usually have a very shiny abdomen, usually free of all the hairs and fuzziness that a bumblebee might have. So if you're confused about if the bee, the large bee you're seeing in your yard is a carpenter bee or a bumblebee, if you look to the back and you see a shiny butt, chances are it's a carpenter bee. That's really the easiest way that I've found to really identify them. So let's just talk about carpenter bees for a bit. Of course, these are the large and yellow black insects that bore holes in the wood and can sometimes be seen patrolling little territories. The males have about 10 feet by 10 feet uh, zones, I believe, that they constantly patrol. And actually, they're shown to be smart enough that they recognize their neighbors. And so actually, the, they know who the other carpenter bees are that live next to them and have territories next to them. And they actually won't bother them as much as other insects that they see flying through. Uh, pretty smart for a bee. Now, these traits, uh, as far as boring holes in the wood, give carpenter bees a bad rap that it really does not deserve. They're an important part of the ecosystem for several main reasons. They pollinate flowers, they feed birds and other species, and they increase the yield of certain plant species as well. The damage they do to buildings is annoying, but really only just that. Interestingly, what they do is they burrow into wood against the grain for about an inch or so, and then they take a right turn and they borrow along with the wood grain. And so actually they do very little structural damage to the wood that they burrow in. Now the, the major damage that comes from carpenter bee nests is when other predators like a woodpecker comes along, notices that nest is there and then just goes crazy on your wood. Um, but I've heard stories of barns that have been infested by carpenter bees for like 75 years and they're still standing. Now I don't know how load bearing they are, but that just gives you an, an example of how little structural damage carpenter bees actually do to the wood. And so really it is an annoyance. The best way to keep them away from your wood is to keep them well stained or well painted. Now carpenter bees have very fascinating life cycles, especially among bees. They're some of the most ancient bees that we have. Carpenter bees can live for almost four years, it's thought. And now most bees, again, in their adult form only live for several weeks. So they're ancient, they're the true owls. Well, I guess it doesn't make sense. But so um, what they do actually, they, they're a semi-social species where in the first several years of their life, they don't, live the, they don't leave the burrows that they make into wood. 
They have house tending duties for the first few years of their life. So actually all the carpenter bees you see out flying around are already several years old. They're already ancient by bee standards. Something not to do if you do have carpenter bees in your house, don't plug up the hole. Because like we just talked about, there are still bees in the nest and they'll just burrow right around the plug that you made. You won't really make any, um, any headway that way. I have found that sometimes if you've got a bad infestation, putting untreated uh, wood, like two by fours, nearby but somewhere where you won't move it, or uh, pieces of wood that you've cut down, something that might be more palatable to carpenter bees sometimes entices them to move and take up residence somewhere other than your house. Unfortunately, our houses do mimic their natural setting in real life, which is a dead standing tree, which a house is a very pretty dead standing tree. Um, so you can't blame them for, for taking residence. Again, make sure your wood is painted and or stained and sealed as quickly as possible, and that seems to be the best deterrent. Really try to tackle the problem before they move in. Now, carpenter bees are the largest bees in North America, and because of that, they're capable of some things that other bees just aren't built to do. Inclement weather that normally gets in the way of pollination can be overcome by sheer size, such as wind and rain. Rain showers and wind that would knock smaller insects out of the skies are shrugged off by these buzzing beasts. They're also able to perform admirably in cold weather. These bees pick up a lot of the slack in pollination, especially in the spring and fall, in colder seasons when other insects simply aren't flying. Now, the size of these pollinators also serves to scare away many pollinators outright. So because of this, these are some of our most docile species, even though they are a semi-social species. They very rarely give you any, any trouble at all. Now, the males are what usually can be seen buzzing around patrolling properties, and these bees do have a lot of personality. They'll come up to you, they'll challenge you, they're not afraid of you, they'll headbutt you, but they cannot sting. These males do not have stingers, even though they are very brave, uh, sometimes too much so. Now, it's, it's pretty easy to identify a male from a female. If you look on their forehead, the males have this really bright yellow spot. And so if there's a carpenter bee getting right up in your face and you're at all worried that maybe it's going to sting you, if, it's, if it has that yellow dot, it's all talk. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> and something, again, to uh, just keep in mind, for all of these stinging species, as a general rule of thumb, if you see them, they're probably not going to sting you. These bees and wasps don't stick around to wait for you to notice them and then go, oh, and then sting you. They'll sting you before you even notice them, and then they'll run away. So really, if you're watching an insect that's crawling on you, it's not looking for the perfect place to sting you. It's just kind of smelling you and seeing if you might have any salts or anything that it might like to lick up off of your skin. Um, so it's easier said than done. Um, but Take, uh, take heart in the fact that these bees would most likely sting you before you ever saw them. And if they're on you, they could really care less what they're on. You just must smell like something good to them or who knows. Now, um, these large bees, uh, such as carpenter bees and bumblebees, are important food sources for birds, especially in the spring when there aren't many more flying insects. So just another reason to have uh, big populations of these in your area is just to provide food sources for some of these larger predators that feed on flying insects. Now, carpenter bees, like I just talked about, they're able to recognize one another, and they've actually been found to make it back home after being moved seven miles away from their hive. And now these are in locations that they've never been before. So just by geolocating or using landscapes that they had seen way far off in the distance, they're able to orient themselves and get back to the hive. Now, a lot of these bees have a lot more intelligence than we give them credit for. Um, they have brains normally about the size of the tip of a pin. However, it's been shown that bumblebees can count to five. It's thought they can recognize faces. And also recent studies have shown that bumblebees can solve laboratory problems using ways and methods that they haven't been taught how to use. There was a recent laboratory experiment where bumblebees had a ball that they had to roll to a certain spot in order to get a nectar reward. And those bumblebees learned from watching other bumblebees do it, but also bumblebees who weren't shown how to do it eventually figured out how to do it as well. It's just mind-blowing that the feats that these insects can do with such tiny brains. And actually, neuroscientists are using bee brains to try and understand really the core difference between our huge brains and these tiny brains and how we both can accomplish some similar things 
and really the main difference between the two. Uh, it's all a bit over my head, but from what I gather, really the major things that we gather from our spaced out brains is memory and clarity. So we seem to me me memorize things much easier and for longer periods of time than bees do and in much more clarity than they do. But of course, they only live for a fraction of our lifetime, so they really don't need that memory much anyway. They generally live in some semi-social settings, um, and there are two species of carpenter bee seen in North Carolina, the eastern carpenter bee and the southern carpenter bee. Now this, I believe, is a type of southern carpenter bee, but I'm not sure, I may be wrong. Uh, what generally you can tell the southern carpenter bee apart from the eastern carpenter bee is the southern has a little red vest of fur on it, whereas the eastern carpenter bee does not have any different colored hair besides uh, black and yellow. And again, look at the shininess of especially the butt, a dead giveaway. Now, can anyone tell me if this is a bumblebee or a carpenter bee by this cursory glance? Exactly, it looks like a bumblebee, so I'm pretty sure it's a bumblebee. So as forests are cut down and manicured, many of the dead trees are the first to be removed. This leaves carpenter bees with very few options for nesting sites. As we've talked about before, it's more of a consequence of that culture of cutting and removing that really they're drawn to houses. So again, just try and treat all your wood before it becomes a problem. Now, some species of plant, like the bottle gentian here, have blooms that require pollination by large, strong insects, such as bumblebees and carpenter bees, to actually get into the flower. So bottle gentians, I mean, they're like a vice grip closed. They need a big, big pollinator with enough brute force to actually force its way up into that bloom and get inside. And so bumblebees and carpenter bees are incredibly important for pollinating some of these incredibly restrictive plant species. So fostering populations of native Hymenoptera can be as easy as leaving parts of your property untamed and wild. This means providing overwintering habitat in the form of leaf piles, dead trees, areas of light mulch and bare soil, and tufts of grass. Try to have at least one plant in bloom during the spring, summer, and fall. And for those plants, try to plant them in groups of three or so. This serves to make them a more attractive bullseye to any insects that are passing makes it easier for them to locate these plants both through smell and sight. Now, many hymenoptera, like wasps and bees, like we've learned, only live for a matter of weeks in their adult form. So simply letting your grass and plants on your property grow for a week or two longer between cuttings can really go a long way to giving necessary nesting, habitat, and protection for these species. So really, just take it easy. Ensure your neighbors that you're growing up your lawn a little bit on purpose and hopefully they'll get the message. <laughs> also, stop using pesticides. Studies have, have begun to show that many pesticides, including fungicides, exhibit powerful sublethal effects on the insects that they come into contact with. This means that when an insect comes into contact with these chemicals, even though it might not die, more than likely its brain is damaged. Throughout their lives, bees especially are known to learn, uh, learn how to efficiently find and pollinate different types of flowers. And they learn these while they visit different types of flowers. They learn these skills through experience. Recent studies are starting to show that even when bees are exposed to pesticides and sublethal effects, these skills are lost. And so these bees are incredibly hampered in their ability to forage. And as a consequence, their life cycle is incredibly hampered. These pesticides are doing extreme damage to, pests and, to bees and wasps, among many other insects. And even if they aren't dying, uh, we're just now learning the true effects of a lot of these pesticides. As we learn through a lot of uh, past uh, sage knowledge, uh, fostering populations of beneficial insects in and around your property can really go a long way towards combating pests on its own, almost to a point where you almost never need to use pesticides. And so really, the focus should be establishing these networks of beneficial insects to take care of your problems for you so that you don't have to rely to these uh, extremely damaging pesticides. Now, um, when you're planting things for native insect populations, again, try to focus on native species as many of our native pollinators are very fine-tuned to their native plants. <clears throat> 
Uh, again, try to avoid cultivated varieties that focused on large scale bloom manipulation, like double blooms, which again detract from the resources that a flower is able to give. Keep in mind that many common weeds, weeds, are actually native flowering plants. Again, always remember the saying that a weed is a plant in the wrong place. It's really a subjective issue. And once you start to appreciate many of these weeds in and around your area, you'll find that a lot of them are actually very beautiful wildflowers in and of their own. So really, I encourage you this year to really take a step back and appreciate some of these creepers and crawlers that are coming up in your plants and leave them be and kind of see what they do. Of course, it's always a good idea to know of any invasive plants that might be in your area. Miscanthus is a big one here. Um, but um, again, just try and take a step back. It's always very tempting to exert as much control onto the ecosystem around us as possible. But let it do its thing. Uh, and it really, most of your problems as far as uh, pests and weeds go are more, um, more imposed on us by ourselves than by nature itself, if that makes sense. So having a garden and property teeming with native hy Hymenoptera is a bonus in and of itself, as your pests are kept to a manageable level and your plants are perfectly pollinated. Being able to watch these animals thrive around you is enough of a reason to foster them on your property. However, the fact is that the ecosystems around us, and by consequence ourselves, are entirely dependent on these ancient, efficient, and largely unnoticed creatures in all of our backyards. Thank you. And this, I'll put all this up so you can look on this online.